Well, thank you everyone for coming back for the afternoon session. I'm Rima Shaposhnikov. I'm one of the faculty and assistant clinical professors with UCLA and Westlake. And this year we created something different. We want, I wanted to include a, a session on women GI problems specifically that affect your female patients. Uh, so um, the three topics we'll cover today are common GI medications used in pregnancy and lactation. We'll talk about uh, we have a pleasure of actually introducing two amazing surgery colleagues who will talk about hemorrhoids, anal fissures, anal prolapse, and incontinence. So a lot of issues that you see in, common, uh, in your common practices. So without further ado, uh, common GI medications and pregnancy. Um, things that I'm going to talk about today is uh, the change in the FDA approach to the medications as of uh, 2015. The common GI issues uh, that we usually see in pregnancy being the heartburn, constipation, nausea, and vomiting, and the misconception uh, of the harm and the benefit to those medications, and of course, uh, endoscopic procedures during pregnancy. There we go. So as you can see the, uh, on the right side, the new labeling now as of 2015 includes not only the labor and delivery in the pregnancy category, but the lactation category and now includes nursing mothers. And a completely new section uh, talks about female and male reproduction. So now when you talk to your patient, it is actually up to you to discuss everything uh, in sight. And if you remember, these are the categories we used to use, the A through X. And so FDA made the decision for you, telling you about the animal studies and the possible human studies, and gave you a grade, whether it was B or C or D, and of course X implied contraindication in use, but D, you still had a positive evidence of human fetal risk, but of course the benefits were up to you. So now you are going to discuss the risks and the studies with a patient, and we'll talk a little bit uh, in detail about that. So of course some of you here, not maybe all of you, will remember thalidomide. This was an over-the-counter medication used as a sleeping pill, and then there was an unknown or a common benefit to it. So with the thalidomide use, it was actually noted to help with morning sickness. So over a million women in Germany took this medication without realizing that uh, fetal uh, deformities, patients where their kids were born with malformation of limbs, and that connection between thalidomide and that was not evident until 1961, so almost four years later. Interestingly enough, 70% of uh, recent f uh, pregnant females that were interviewed had actually no uh, concept of thalidomide. They did not know that thalidomide caused uh, any uh, problems. However, there are other the misconception or actually perception of medications and harm uh, was tested to see what our patients are really believing. So in one of the UK studies, over 1,100 women were tested, and they, they were asked about harm of both the disease that they had, for example, a UTI or heartburn, as well as the medication that we're gonna use. And most women thought that medications were beneficial. Some thought they were overused. About 40% of women actually thought that if their doctor spent more time with them, less medication would be prescribed. But what really puzzled the people that did the study was that out of 1,100 women, 17% of them had a UTI, and they thought that the risk of UTI was minimal, but the risk of antibiotic use was higher than that, and therefore 60% of women in that study alone did not take any medication because they were scared uh, of the medication. Same went for heartburn. 78% of women had heartburn, but only 60% of patients actually filled their prescription because, again, more worried about the, uh, the medication use. Interestingly enough, 49% of women got their data from the doctors, 70% of women discussed this with their nurse practitioner or a pharmacist, and greater than 50% looked at the internet. So we as doctors are only getting 49% of those questions. So remember that internet, their next door neighbor, right, um, or TV show that they're watching may answer the questions for them. The misperception of medication is not just limited to the patients alone. A Swiss study actually looked at uh, 1,300 doctors and said to them blindly to look at paracetamol, which is another name for Tylenol, and said, look at it and tell us, would you use this in a pregnant female? After reading the monograph, 38% of doctors said they would not. Now, the monograph actually said that the medication is not teratogenic, the medication causes no miscarriages, no malformations, but is present in both urine and the, uh, and the, blood, uh, and the cord of the infant, so the doctor said they were not going to use it. So what are the uh, most pregnant women concerned about? Although they may not be aware of thalidomide, about a third of patients were still concerned about birth defect, miscarriages, or their child developing an allergic reaction, especially in women who were in their first trimester. This is from a Danish study when they were given nine um, 
nine different class medications. The women assigned lower benefit scores were usually single, smoking, or did not have any family history of birth defects. This is a bit of a busy slide, but if you look at the nausea, heartburn, and constipation, the, those, the three most prevalent conditions, this is from the same UK study of 1,100 people, um, you'll notice that the numbers for constipation, 50% of women experience constipation, but, but only 19% actually took medication. Same goes for nausea, 78% of women experienced nausea, but only 9% of them took medication. So we have a lot to work with to convince our patients that the medications are safe to use. This is from Matthew's Cochrane database, both 2014 and 15. We talked about interventions for nausea and vomiting, and what was noted, there's really no lack of high evidence uh, to support any particular intervention. That doesn't mean the interventions do not work, and those listed below... Um, acupuncture, acu-stimulation, uh, acupressure, this is LA, of course those three are definitely listed. Ginger, chamomile, all of those may work on anecdotal evidence, but not enough to support or for us to prescribe. Uh, but please inform your patients that some of the herbal laxatives or antiemetics that they're buying over the counter may not be safe. If you can look at fenugreek, that's actually teratogenic. Senna seed may be safe. Ginger is safe to use. Flax seed may be safe, but only from second trimester. So just make sure you're asking your patients about the over-the-counter medications they're using because not everything is safe. Interestingly enough, although patients were not taking medications in UK, here in the United States from 2001 to 2014, we have a rise of endansetron from less than 1% to now over 22% of, um, uh, of prevalence. The prevalence that currently is around 15%. So we're definitely prescribing antiemetics. So when patients come to you, they've already tried the over-the-counter medications and are they having any symptoms, especially for heartburn, we usually start with an H2 blocker and try to tell them slowly to start with that and then perhaps advance to a PPI. So how safe are the uh, H2 blockers? From an Israeli database of over 117,000 uh, pregnant women, what they noticed was there was in fact no association of perinatal mortality, premature delivery, low birth weight, or low APGAR scores. And uh, from the same author, uh, metoclopramide also was not associated with any complications. How about PPI in pregnancy? Well, if you look up in the description of omeprazole, it does say there's increased risk of hypospadias that was reported. So this is exactly what you would read if you were talking to the patient and pulled it up uh, about the medication. It says that uh, during pregnancy, the study by Endurka was based on a small number of exposures, and of course, the same association was not found. It then goes on to say that additional available studies have not shown any increased risk of birth defects. So if you actually looked at that Endurka study, they used 4,524 cases compared to almost 6,000 controls. And so, um, a lot of studies are from the Danish na national database. And they showed that the odds ratio was almost 4.3%. Undensitron had a stronger association with cleft palate of odds ratio of 2.37%. And interestingly enough, Antacid had a reduced risk of a cleft palate. Now the authors themselves concluded that this indeed could be a chance finding and warrants further investigation. So additional study was done also from uh, Danish registry, and this one uh, for almost, almost a 12-year study, using 430,000 people, so almost 100, 000, uh, 100 times more than the previous study. And what they noticed was that the risk of hypospadias was about 0.7% with patients who used P uh, with, in mothers who used PPI versus 0.6% in women who did not, with the national average in Denmark at the time of hypospadias between 03 to 0.8%, so again, within normal limits. And yet the study is still being mentioned uh, as a side effect of PPI. Omeprazole was not associated with any increased risk for congenital malformation. And just so you know, the, what is listed is that although there's no birth defects, one small study of lansaprazole showed that if mothers used it one, to four, one week to four weeks prior to conception, there was a tiny risk of uh, malformations. Again, not statistically significant. The risk was 3.4% of patients exposed to PPI versus 2.6% of women not exposed to PPI. So these are the small numbers. But however, you are going to discuss this with your patients because if they are able to look it up, uh, they will be asking you these questions. 
but overall conclusion was that PPIs are not causing malformation. Well, how about asthma? There's a latest study that just came out, again from Danish registry, that appears to be the easiest registry to publish from. Uh, over 200,000 patients uh, were sampled, and what they noticed was that the prenatal exposure, excuse me, to PPIs and H2 blockers caused an odds uh, ratio of asthma of 1.41, which is actually similar to what we say with PPI and C. diff. So quite concerning. Now, a very small study, and what they did was they took at least two prescriptions of uh, both beta agonist and inhaled glucocorticosteroids or an admission for asthma to make that decision. Uh, a second significantly larger study by Soriano said there's actually no uh, association, especially if you adjust for genetic factors and environmental studies. Now remember what I said, most of your patients are getting information from their nurses, not from their GI, right? 70% are getting their uh, information from combination of nurses and pharmacologists. Well, this is a paper from 2017 from Nursing Standard, and it automatically already says that pregnancy heartburn drugs are linked to childhood asthma. So who do you think your patient is going to trust? Um, so please make sure you're discussing this so you are not scaring our patients with the data that's available. Oh, that slide doesn't look as great, but all right. So PPI use in pregnancy is not associated with congenital malformations or spontaneous abortions or preterm delivery, absolutely safe to use. To continue the breastfeeding and PPI, that's also a concern. I have a lot of patients coming in asking whether they can continue their medication, although the heartburn of pregnancy is gone, they're now breastfeeding and may need uh, to have... Um, to have the medication. Well, breastfeeding is actually considered acceptable if the relative infant dose is less than 10% and unacceptable if it's greater than 25%. Of all the PPI used uh, um, that I listed below, which are currently uh, uh, listed, omeprazole is excreted into the milk with a relative infant dose of 0.2 to 0.43%, so significant, significantly lower than 1%. And again, as mentioned, less than 10% is considered acceptable. The data on the other medication is either limited or unknown. Now, if you read the paragraph on omeprazole and breastfeeding, uh, the two studies that I mentioned, I wrote them here for both Plan and Marshall, have actually only used one pregnant female. So the pantaprazole was studied in one breastfeeding female 10 months postpartum who followed a single dose of 40 milligrams uh, uh, protonics, and milk and serum samples were obtained over 24 hours, and that's what showed the exposure um, uh, to the infant of only 0.14% uh, of maternal dose. Same with omeprazole, although no adverse effects were noted. Again, one infant um, study was conducted. So I mentioned to you a whole new category with uh, FDA, and that's talking about fertility. So let's talk about male fertility. Total motile sperm count appears to be a better indicator for the severity of male factor infertility than the WHO uh, sperm classification system. The use of PPI 12 to 6 months preceding the semen analysis was appeared, at least in this study, to be associated with a threefold, threefold higher risk of low motility. The authors concluded that, of course, further workup needs to be done, but perhaps a long-term increase in the gastric pH does result in the decline of sperm quality. To shift gears a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about constipation. So I'm going to discuss briefly both use of fiber, probiotics, and laxatives. Uh, one study of the fiber supplementation was done in about 40 wo uh, women. It was a moderate quality uh, uh, of, 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 excuse me, of evidence, and it did show that women tolerated fiber during pregnancy, in fact, had a higher frequency of stools, and uh, um, there's a stool, harder stools decreased when looser, looser stools improved. So fiber is safe to use in pregnancy. When uh, using a Cochrane database in 2016 to compare stimulants versus bulk farming laxatives, it was known that stimulant laxatives compare, uh, actually showed improvement in constipation, of course, causing more abdominal discomfort. There was no significant, uh, this is interesting enough, no significant difference in women's uh, satisfaction with either of the medication, but bulk farming laxatives did show uh, relief of abdominal discomfort. So again, all of those are safe during pregnancy. Probiotics and uh, uh, pregnancy and lactation, I'm not sure if you can see that slide as well. Um, lactobacillus and bifidobitus actually had no effect on the incidence of either C-section, low birth weight, or uh, gestational age, so again, safe to use, and no studies have been done to date on sacro, um, 
Saccharomyces. Now, for lactation, they actually does show a decreased incidence in uh, infantile colic and regurgitation in infants, so that might be um, something to consider and use if needed. Colon cleansing agents using the old category of F FDA nomenclature, uh, polyethylene glycol was considered category C. So treatment with PEG did significantly increase the uh, evacuation episodes per week. And again, the study was limited to about 37 women, but as you can see, over 70% of them had re re uh, resolution of their constipation. The sodium phosphate preparation were actually not studied in pregnancy, were assigned category C, and they were just, were, there's a caution to obviously due to uh, fluid, and electrolyte, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. So in the next few minutes, I just want to talk about guidelines for endoscopy, because that's the second question that usually comes up is somebody comes in, they have symptoms throughout their pregnancy, when do you take them into your GI suite? So some of the considerations prior to endoscopy, you want to make sure that that procedure is, con is necessary or that problem may cause potential harm to either mother and fetus unless it is performed. You want to consult your ob before doing any procedures on a pregnant woman. If it occurs before 24 weeks of pregnancy, consider a fetal um, heartbeat with a Doppler before and after the procedure. And after 24 weeks of gestation, please consider um, uterine contraction monitor at all times. Try to delay any procedure until a second trimester. You want to avoid also placing the patient on their back. You want to avoid any uh, uterus, uh, uterine compression of either aorta or IVC. And of course, anything is contraindicated with placenta abrupture or immediate delivery. All three procedures that are listed here have been uh, retrospectively noted to be safe. Um, so for EGD, there's over 140 cases uh, published in the literature. Uh, it appears that they're, that they're safe with no premature uh, labor or congenital abnormalities. Of note, uh, one of the studies that even showed a 95% diagnostic yield for an upper GI bleed. So if properly used during pregnancy, it can be beneficial. For colonoscopies, we have retrospective studies, about 48 cases for FLEG-6 and about 20 cases for colons. And again, if you're looking for a mass or if it's an emergency for a bleed, uh, it appears to be safe. Um, and one of the studies did show a small risk of pancreatitis that increased in the 65 patients that were evaluated. Again, other confounding factors, perhaps there was already a common bile duct stone that was not addressed. Um, just, these are just uh, ASG guidelines for performing endoscopy. You obviously want to wait unless there's either severe refractory nausea, dysphagia or donophagia, uncontrolled or continuous bleeding, strong suspicion of colonic or esophageal mass, diarrhea, the patient is dehydrated, but the workup is negative to date. And of course, for biliary, you want to make sure that there's either a ductal injury suspicion, pancreatitis, cholangitis, or cholidocolithiasis before you proceed and put a patient in your ERCP suite. Um, just briefly, for sedation agents, meperidine is not considered teratogenic, and although there's no association with fetal distress, please be aware there may be some fetal cardiac variability lasting up to one hour um, uh, after the procedure. Morphine, you want to avoid that at all costs, and it does uh, cross fetal blood barri uh, brain barrier faster than other medications. Fentanyl appears not to be teratogenic, but it is embryocidal in rats. Medalazam, we prefer not to use any benzos. However, um, it does appear to be safe, especially if used in the second trimester, not the first one. And, and no current studies are available for propofol, but both anesthesiologists and GI societies are considering it safe to use during pregnancy, of course, with the uh, presence of anesthesiologists. Regarding safety and lactation, so that's always a concern for my patients is when do they need to breast, uh, uh, breastfeed and or when, whether they need to, uh, to dump the milk. Well, medallism appears to be excreted in breast milk and we are asking patients not to breastfeed uh, or nurse for at least four hours following the procedure. Although again, very small data available for that. Um, it appears that American College of Pediatrics does support use of fentanyl and that appears to be compatible with breastfeeding. Meperidin may be detected up to 24 hours in breast milk, and propofol, though excreted, appears to be safe. Other agents are just listed for you uh, as well that you can uh, look and see if you're safe to use. So in conclusion, as you can see, the FDA guidelines have changed and giving you more power to discuss with your patients all the risks and all the studies that are available. So it is up to you to make that decision and of course to discuss every possibility uh, of 
uh, the medication and how it affects not only the mother but also the fetus, possibly reproductive rights of both the mother and the father involved. Keep in mind the data is extremely limited, but majority of medication appears to be safe. The perception of patients, although, does need to be addressed because although we think the medication is beneficial, it is up to us to convince the patients that they're safe to use and safe to proceed. But please carefully address, of course, the underlying condition with the patient, the benefit of the treatment, the drug of choice, and the potential toxicity, not only to the mother, but to the infant as well, and as I mentioned earlier, the fertility concerns. Thank you so much for your time.